God for the people of God, thanks be to God. And for those who are grateful that they didn't have to read the scripture this morning on video, that's the tongue twister that it is, the people said amen. Um, when we said the scripture, I said, oh my, whoever has to say all these Old Testament names are, are not going to be super excited about it. Nonetheless, in our Old Testament text, there is a good story of grace and an invitation of mercy and love. Will you bow with me for a word of prayer? Almighty and gracious God, we give thanks for that invitation that you continue to extend to us to come to you. As we heard the choir so beautifully sing, that we would come and rest with you. Oh God, wherever we may be in our journey this morning, whatever we may be facing or recovering from the weeks before, enable us to feel your grace, your unconditional love, and rest within you today. Oh God, in this time of worship, stir in us something new and afresh, that we would be nourished by your grace and by your love, that we could go out and share this invitation with the world. Oh God, now rescue me from me, hide me in your cross, and I'll be so careful to give you all the praise and glory. In your son's holy name, amen. So when I think of a banqueting table, at a big extended table, most especially at holidays, I think of my grandmother's house. When you walk into the front door, and you didn't have to walk into the front door, it wasn't that formal. It really was in proximity of when you showed up and where you parked. Because there was always at least 15 vehicles there, uh, stacked in that driveway as much as you could. Uh, but often, I was the one that would be walking through the front door. And so as we came through the front door, uh, immediately when you walk in, you're in a, for a formal entry hallway. Just to the left, actually, actually, it's just to the right, uh, there is a formal living room. And then on Christmas morning, we open all of our gifts, all that stuff. Then it extends into a formal dining. Those two rooms are separated on each end uh, with three columns that as children we would slide through until we had grown a little bit bigger than we thought and could not fit through those banisters anymore. Uh, but that's how those rooms were divided. And so every holiday, most especially Thanksgiving and Christmas, uh, we would take that formal dining table, it was a family heirloom, put over the longest tablecloth we had. Then we would send the guys to the back porch, bring in the picnic table, put it end to end with the dining room table. Then we would grab the card tables and put those to the end. And we would continue to use tablecloths or if we needed to, a sheet. And that table would go from the dining room through the living room all the way into the entry hall. And so we always had room and space. There was always room for people to be there, to come and grow. And there were more than 17 of us grandchildren, uh, before we all got married and added even more to the family. But there was always room in space. Now, before you say awe or have that Pollyannish spirit, uh, let me just tell you, this is the most uh, broken and blended fam part of my family. Uh, and so at this table, you had exes, you had steps, Step family, step, pa or step parents, step siblings, former step siblings, friends of friends, everyone was invited to the table. Whether you were born into this, married into it, or invited into it, you had a place at the table. No matter what, there was always a place. It was up to you to accept the invitation. As soon as you knew about it, it was up to you to accept the invitation and to show up. Now, there were some tough things that kind of hung in the air. And if you didn't think you could handle it, then maybe you should leave while dishes are being cleaned before we hacked it out over a family card game. But nonetheless, everyone had a place at the table. It was up to you to accept that invitation and to show up. You may have family memories like that as well. This table that goes on and on and on and has room for everybody. Maybe you are excited 
uh, that we are having a COVID-less uh, Thanksgiving this year. And you're excited to bring more people to the table. Maybe you're in a family, you leave a chair open because someone is no longer there that was there at the last big family meal. But nonetheless, there is something about coming around a table and breaking bread together, acknowledging that we belong together, that we are to love one another. That's part of a covenant with family, and sometimes we do it well, sometimes we do it better than other times, but we are called to be around this table. And there is often this invitation, this open welcome to come and be to feast. But that is not the norm in the Old Testament. That is not the norm when a king takes over a new land. Often the tradition was when a king would take over, they would annihilate anybody of the previous king. They had to exterminate any opportunities of a rise of threat to power. They had to get rid of any potential threats. And it's not any different in our story this morning when David is there and asks, is there anyone else left of the household? In case you didn't do your uh, Bible history lesson on your way in this morning with your coffee, let me just give you a quick um, catch up, a summary of where we are. So the Israelites came out of Egypt. They were rescued from their slavery. They came in, well, up to Mount Sinai. They made a covenant with God, that they would be his faithful people. We see story after story where they epically messed that up. They fell short of that. And so as they progress forward, it becomes evident that they need a strong, faithful leader. So then we see Samuel. Samuel is going to be this prophet who is going to lead them and give them direction. Yet, What we discover is they look around them and they say, everyone else has a king, we want one. Have you ever heard that in your house? Everyone else has one, we want one. Maybe as you're getting closer to the holidays, you hear that. Everyone else has this, why can't I have that? And that's what the Israelites do. They say, everyone else has a king, why can't we have one? And Samuel said, but that's not how God planned this. This is not what God intended. They said, yeah, but this is what we want. So Samuel, as the prophet, goes to God and says, I know you're not going to like this, and I know this is not what you planned, but this is what your people want. Long and short of it, God says, okay, give them a king. So they give him a king, and on the outside, Saul looks good. He could probably check every box for a Disney prince. He's tall, he's handsome, he's masculine. He checks all the boxes on the outside. On the inside, he is not loyal. Uh, He does not, he lacks integrity. Uh, He just blatantly disobeys God. And so as quickly as he rises to power, he begins to come down. And as he begins to spiral out of good leadership, there is a young shepherd boy who is able to conquer giants. And as he begins to slowly find favor with God and grow in popularity and awareness that people say, oh, there's something in this young boy. This boy named David begins to gain favor and power. Saul finds out about that, grows jealous. He grows jealous because he knows that David has favor with God and he does not. He begins to pursue him, goes through anything and everything to pursue him. Somewhere in this journey on the run, David befriends uh, Jonathan, Saul's son. Begin, befriends him, they become besties. In this, it, is not, it didn't take long for Jonathan to realize what's happening. Jonathan realized God's favor is on David. And if, Jonathan, if God's favor is on David, that means that Saul's going to be taken out. That David is going to become the king and Jonathan, his dad, King Saul, and everyone connected to them will be wiped off this planet. And so Jonathan, picking up on this, says, David, this is what we've done for each other. This is what we have been through. Will you make this covenant promise with me that you will show kindness and faithfulness to my family? And David says, yes. They enter into this covenant, this loyalty, 
to care for one another. No matter what happens when the dust settles, David promises he will care for Jonathan's family. David is now in his royal place, in his palace, and he is moving up in that chain. He has all the power and all the authority. He could have easily said, you know what? That family's no longer here. Who's going to know that he and I had this little word, that we have this little promise? Who's going to know? But that's not the attitude he takes. He remembers the promise. He remembers the covenant that they had with one another, So he calls some people in, those people who would know who is who. Just as I'm new in this church, if I'm like, well, who is this person and who is this person? I call Susie in. I call Stan in and I'm like, who is this person and how is this one connected to this? Likewise, uh, he calls in a servant and he said, is there anyone left of Saul's family? I said, yeah, there's one person. There's one person. He said, well, go get him. You see, this person had been injured in that whole big battle where Saul's family was taken out. The nurse was trying to escape, and Jonathan was five, not Jonathan, Jonathan's son was five years old, dropped by his nurse, and was crippled. And he was either spared or he was overlooked in all of this, and was living in the land of Lodabar, a land of nothing, a land of no greens, a land of no place. And the king has summoned him to come to the palace. You see, for this young grandson of a fallen king, a crippled, lame grandson of a fallen king, had two strikes against him. In that time, in that culture, to be crippled meant you had no use for your family. You could not provide for them. You could not continue on with your family lineage. And to be that of a fallen king... He was on the outskirts, the fringes of society, trying to be invisible. They'd make sure that nobody saw him, it didn't bring attention to himself, to make sure there was no more harm caused. And as I read this story, I wonder this morning, those people in our lives, in our community, that have at least two strikes against them, that are either invisible because it is too hard for us to acknowledge their brokenness, or because of the own, their stuff that they carry, they try to be invisible. That nobody else would see their pain, their shame, and their brokenness. And that are on the fringes of society who have at least two strikes against, uh, against them and are just managing to get by. In this particular week, when we celebrate our veterans and we give them honor, I'm reminded of the many who went overseas and come back with very visible wounds, but most especially those that come back with wounds that we cannot see with human eyes. Those who come back haunted by what they've been experiencing, who come back with a heaviness of what they went through, and that haunts them day after day after day. Sometimes it leads to addiction. Sometimes it leads uh, to a lack of mental health that they cannot function as a quote-unquote normal person day in and day out. And whether by their choice or by these circumstances, they find themselves on the fringes of society with the exception of a few token days a year where everyone says thank you to them. I wonder about those on those fringes of our society. Those who have two strikes against them, whether it is by their own doing or by something else, that we overlook, that we oversee. Can you imagine what it would be to be in that place? To think and believe that you are the weakest link in society. And then you receive the most powerful invitation. The invitation from the most powerful person in that entire kingdom that is summoning you to their place. Can you imagine the fear? Can you imagine the doubt to the overwhelming that they experienced? Because that's what's happening with this young man. And I have to write this on a sticky note because I have a hard time saying his name, Mephibosheth, Mephibosheth. Uh, Say that three times on your way home today. Uh, And that this young man is brought in and he lowers himself to the ground. 
He knows his place. He's before a king. In fact, he compares himself to a dog. And in those days, dogs were not the family-friendly furry pets that we all uh, make pictures of today. They were the unwanted ones. And he compares himself to that, lays himself on the ground before the king. And the king tells them, you have nothing to be worried about. Don't be scared. I don't know about you, but if I was in that place, I think with my nose to the dirt so much that when I breathe, the, the dust is in my nostrils, I would be kind of thinking, yeah, right, easy for you to say, king. Um, but he is there bowing before the king. And the king tells him not once, but four times, you have a place at my table. You have a place at my table. Because I have this covenant with your father, I made this covenant that I would care for you, that I would take care of you. You have a place at my table. And not the corner where you knock your kneecap off the pedestal, but a wonderful place right there with my sons. You have a place at my table. And not only do you have a place at my table, but I'm restoring the lands that belong to your grandfather so that you can make an honest earning. And I'm going to give you the intent. Before you can say, but, 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 I can't do that. I'm going to give you the entire workforce you need to make that work. He gives them all of this out of a covenant, out of a loyalty to care for one another. It reminds me of that covenant that God invited us into, to love our neighbors as ourselves. This is not just an Old Testament text, but rings very true today in the ways that we are called to love our neighbor. As part of the church, we say in our membership vows, as part of our baptismal vows, we say that we will love our neighbor, that we will care for one another. And that includes making space for them at the table. It means opening our eyes and seeing those that are invisible, those that are, have at least two strikes against them on the fringes of society, and saying, you know what, come to my table. You have a place right here. This uh, last week, as we've been working through a number of things, we've been looking at this and the challenge of what does it mean to come to the table? And I'm reminded, we, Jordan and I had this conversation, we kind of push the tradition a little bit. Do we have communion every Sunday just for this series? But I think sometimes we get too wrapped up that it's just communion. This is about us in our Monday through Saturday life. How are we inviting people to the table? Whether it's at school, someone that has been sitting by themselves the entire school year, what does it mean to invite them to come and sit next to you? Someone at work who is always just kind of in their corner, drinking their coffee by themselves, inviting them to the table. Inviting someone's voice to the table who comes to meeting after meeting but doesn't feel that their voice matters. What does it mean to bring to the table, bring them to the table and give them space to voice what God is sharing in them? Yesterday, I had the opportunity to go out to the American GI Museum out in College Station. If you haven't been there, I highly recommend it. Most, many of you know, well, some of you may know, I'm a Gold Star sister, which means I, let, I lost my brother a few years ago in the service. We do a big thing about caring for my brother's uh, son and my, and my son. Uh, two weeks apart, they were due the same day. So yesterday, we had gotten them excited about going out to the museum because they were going to have tanks, 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 and tanks. Those boys' eyes were this big, uh, because not only do they get to go in some of them, they get to shoot some of the guns with paintballs and all that good army stuff. Uh, so they were excited about that. We went out there, they got to ride in what's called a half tank uh, from one of the earlier wars, and they got to make their lap around. And as they were coming back, uh, we noticed that someone rather important had arrived. So we kind of looked to see what was going on. There was this very well-built, tall stature man, everything down his sleeve, his medals, I think went as much as they could uh, on his jacket. And then next to him was a very small man. We thought, who is this? What's going on? This little man here. Come to find out, today he is 93. Uh, he served in World War II, 
You're, I know you're crunching the math there. He served in World War II, then served in the Korean War, and then the Vietnam. Let me tell you about George Ruth when you're trying to figure out this math. He lived in Louisiana at a young age, one of seven siblings. Uh, his mom passed away. There was nothing left for him to do but to get on a bus and head to New Orleans and find work. He did well. He rose as much as he could as a gentleman of his uh, situation in society. Um, he went as high as he could. And someone said, I know somewhere where you can get better work and where you can do well. They sent him down the street to sign some papers. He's never been a man to, challenge, to uh, shy away from challenges. Uh, so he managed through that paperwork. Two weeks later, he got the papers that he was drafted to go across to the war. When he showed up to do his physical and to report to duty, he tried to tell them, I am only 14 years old. And they said, yeah, right, go get in line with the rest of the 14-year-olds. He went through that. He went through basic training and then over to Fort Benning, Georgia, where he tasted his first pancakes. They fattened him up a little bit because... Life had been hard. He had not had that many meals. They fattened him up a little bit, and they sent him overseas. He served some time over there, and then the same half tank, which is uh, this, uh, where it says bad check, that's the vehicle they were going to ride in yesterday, vehicle very similar to that. He was tossed out of that. Um, that happens when you're moving tanks and trucks quickly across rough land. Um, he was tossed out of that, fell underneath, and messed up his shoulder severely. He got to the medic tent, and they realized he was not 18. They patched him up, discharged him from the army at age 17, and sent him home. A few months later, he was of age. He re-enlisted, but in the Coast Guard. He got into the Coast Guard, and he found his niche in the kitchen. They would go out on rough seas, and while all of his crew members were tossing their cookies, he was able to continue to fry bacon and whip up mashed potatoes. And then he went through there 20 plus years, retired there, and then went on to the Texas Department of Corrections uh, to be one of their lead chefs. Throughout his entire life, no matter how stormy the seas were, no matter how rough things were, he continued to extend compassion. He continued to do the means that he needed to to bring people around the table. And the roughest of storms, no matter how scared they were, no matter what they were up against, he was able to bring them around that table. Interestingly, he said that in the Coast Guard, what he remembers, uh, well, I'm going to paraphrase because my iPad locked up. So, in the Coast Guard, he said what stood out to him um, was the Coast Guard is in the business of rescuing. They never give up. They continue to rescue and rescue and do everything that they can to rescue. If you've seen any kind of Hollywood movie or news, you will see that as you are rescued, you're brought in, a blanket is put around you, and then often a meal before you. Likewise, that is what our God is in the business of doing. He is continuously in the business of rescuing us, of pulling us in, wooing us back, and saying, come back to me. Rest from your labors in me. Bringing us back to that table. You know, King David could have just said, forget about it, nobody's going to know. But he proceeded with that covenant of compassion, that he was going to extend that compassion I'm reminded of a hymn, or not a hymn, a praise song that we would sing in college. Uh, his banner over me is love. He invited me to his table, and his banner over me is love. That is what happens when we are invited to God's table. When we accept that invitation, we come to the table, and the banner over us is love. That is what we remember in our baptism, when we are reminded that we are called his beloved. Once we have a seat at the table as disciples, we are called to extend that invitation. To go and when we see people, make room for them at the table. To call people in to be a part of that compassionate work. 
I don't know what your plans are for Thanksgiving, for a friend's giving this year. But I encourage you to think about where God is asking you to make space at your table. Maybe it's someone who has not been a part of the family in a while. Maybe it's a lonely neighbor down the street. Maybe it's making sure that people have the food uh, to have their own table by participating in our Thanksgiving in a bag. But where is God calling you to make space at the table? Because we each have a place. But sometimes we need to be reminded, and sometimes others need our encouragement to come and feast at a table of his grace and love. Will you pray with me? Almighty and gracious God, we give you thanks for that invitation. That invitation that you continue to extend to us over and over. No how many times we may forget, no matter how many times we may run, you continue to woo us in to come and sit at the table. Oh God, then we are offered that gift of your grace, of your eternal life. Oh God, enable us to accept that, to receive it as your gift, and be so bold to go out and share it. God, in particular in this week, we also remember those who feel they have no place at the table. Those that are struggling with the events and things of life, whether it is by their doing or not, oh God, may they feel your grace and mercy. May they know they have a place at the table. On this day, we also remember our veterans, those who have, who have served above and beyond, many who have come home wounded and broken. Oh God, may they know that they are yours, that you call them beloved, that they have a place at this table. For the many who continue to struggle, if it is worth to live another day, oh God, be with them. Then let them know that yes, they have a place with you and at this table of love and mercy. Oh God, we give thanks that your table continues to extend and continues to grow. Enable us to be the church and the disciples you have called us to be. To make room for others, to invite, to encourage, to bring along others to the table. That we may follow in the example of your son who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This morning, our closing hymn, I'm waiting for it. This morning, our closing hymn will be on the screen. Um, I invite you to stand as you are able, uh, the King of Love. Um, I invite you to stand as you are able, and please know that this altar, just like God's table, is always open and available for you to come and be in prayer. If you're looking for a church home where you can feast at the table, I invite you to come down forward, meet Jordan and I, and we will have that conversation with you. Let us stand and sing. <laughs>